Hi, I'm Brandon Butler, and this is Licensing Session 7, Examples and Cases 2, Websites and Other Terms of Use. One concern that may arise in connection with scraping public websites is whether there are any legal repercussions in addition to potential breach of contract when your scraping activity is inconsistent with website policies. Website operators have tried to use federal anti-hacking law, in particular the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, to add teeth to their terms of use. The CFAA bars any unauthorized access to any protected computer, which courts have said means essentially any machine connected to the internet. The most high-profile CFAA prosecution in recent years was brought against the free culture activist Aaron Swartz, who downloaded millions of research papers from JSTOR by circumventing security measures at MIT. Federal prosecutors charged him criminally for violating the CFAA, but were roundly criticized, along with JSTOR and MIT, for their pursuit of the case. Nevertheless, website operators have argued that any access to a site that exceeds the site's terms of use is unauthorized, and this should trigger CFAA liability in their view. Luckily, the clear trend in the courts in recent years has been to reject this argument, at least for public websites. Two recent cases illustrate the point. In HiQ Labs v. LinkedIn, the data analytics firm HiQ was accused of violating the CFAA by scraping public LinkedIn profiles after being ordered directly by LinkedIn to cease and desist from scraping. The Ninth Circuit ruled that authorization is only required for password protected sites or sites that otherwise prevent the general public from viewing the information. The case has been appealed to the Supreme Court, which hasn't yet agreed to hear it. In Sandvik v. Barr, the ACLU brought a challenge to the CFAA on behalf of journalists and researchers who plan to use scraping as well as fake profiles and other deceptive practices to probe whether employment websites were discriminating against some users. This is a well-established way for journalists and investigators to uncover discrimination, but the terms of use of these sites prohibit providing false information. Can site proprietors use federal anti-hacking laws to insulate themselves from discrimination probes simply by changing their terms of use? Citing HiQ v. LinkedIn, the district court found that the CFAA does not apply to scraping public websites, among other behaviors and should only apply when a user bypasses an authentication mechanism, such as a password restriction, designed to ensure that only certain authorized individuals have access to the site. API terms of use and Twitter as an example. The Twitter developer policy, which governs access to data via the Twitter API, is a good example of a robust, enforceable contract governing a commonly used source of research data. The Twitter API makes it easy to retrieve massive amounts of data from the Twitter ecosystem, but Twitter tightly regulates how that data can be used and especially how it can be shared. The Twitter API terms create a strong enforceable contract by ensuring that anyone who participates is required to clearly signal their uh, notice and assent and only permitting access to those who've created an account and agreed to be bound. Twitter makes special allowances for scholarly use, but even academics are prohibited from sharing large corpora of full text tweets. The detailed provisions in the Twitter API, including distinctions between tweet IDs and full text content, warrant a close read by any researcher working with the API. It's clear that Twitter takes these terms seriously and violating them could land you in hot water with the company a political problem that could be very damaging for a researcher who relies on Twitter data for their work. Even material collection, di uh, material digitized from library collections, even public domain material can be governed by tricky terms of service. For example, much of the digitized collection in the Hadi Trust Corpus was created in partnership with Google and limitations on reuse were part of that arrangement. Accordingly, Hadi Trust and its member libraries will typically use terms of use restrictions to ensure that users don't do anything that would place them in breach of their agreement with Google. Additional terms of use govern the Hadi Trust Research Center's text and data mining tools. These terms are designed to ensure that Hadi and its users remain within the bounds of what fair use permits. 
Another example of a context where library materials may be governed by terms of use is collections digitized in partnership with a vendor like Adam Matthew. It's very common for these materials to be in the public domain, but because they are rare and may not exist in digital form anywhere else, it's possible for the vendor to keep them behind paywalls and monetize access using licenses. To make that model work, vendors like Adam Matthew typically require users to agree not to download collections in bulk or to share them publicly. Some libraries, museums, and special collections impose their own terms of use on materials they post online. Sometimes the goal of these terms is just to ensure that the library or archives receives credit as the source of collections materials. Other times, the institution is trying to guard against liability or political embarrassment for itself by ensuring users don't do anything untoward, or at least documenting that it took steps to warn or constrain their users. 